Steve Roberts. He is the president of the Chamber of Commerce in West Virginia. Good morning, Steve. How are you, sir? Rob, I'm well, and good morning to you. Good morning, Admiral. Congratulations, Councilman. Uh, one quick word on that. My mother told me a number of years ago, enjoy your youth. So that'll be my advice to the councilman today. Yes. Yeah. I appreciate that, sir. You know, I was talking about this with somebody the other day. You only stay in your prime for a short period of time. Well, I guess I would argue on that. I think every year you're in your prime. And I once asked my mother, would you want to turn to my age? She said, no, I'm enjoying life the way it is. And and I feel the same way. I enjoyed my youth. I enjoyed my middle age. I'm enjoying today. Let, let me point out, Steve, that the Admiral has $7 billion in Tesla stock. <laughs> <laughs> and it went up like $18 a share yesterday. So he's been this eagle's grin today. I think Bob Hope called that the gracious dispensation of age. I remember when Bob Dole said that. Uh (laughs) Absolutely. Uh, Steve, we are more than halfway through the legislative session now, and uh, we at least have a a formative debate between the Senate's tax plan and the House's tax plan. We're no longer waiting for the Senate's tax plan. And I'd like to get your input on what you're seeing in Charleston this week as we start to count down the days to the end of the session. And then I'd like to get your input on the whole form energy debate that's been taking place. But first, let's start with the tax cuts. Sure. Well, as you uh, just said, we have, we're coming up on three weeks to go in the legislative session. That countdown begins to go pretty fast when you get past the, uh, the three-week point. Uh, we've already passed the date for new bills to be introduced into the House, and we're coming up on that date next week in the Senate. So uh, so we'll know uh, what bills uh, we're looking at. Yeah, uh, I say that to say I've long been a proponent of uh, serious bills uh, really do better when they are um, introduced uh, earlier uh, because there's more time to study them and figure out what they do. So I'm, I'm actually a proponent of pre-filing of bills or at least of the particularly serious bills, so that we don't uh, do knee-jerk uh, legislation. I just put that out for your listeners to think about a little bit. In many states, they require pre-filing of bills, or at least the more important bills. That being said, we have a good, earnest discussion going on. We're going to ask Craig Blair. Uh, recently said it's just a wonderful thing that we can ta- be talking about tax cuts. Now we're talking about which taxes to cut. From a Chamber of Commerce point of view, we like the idea of lower, flatter taxes. Um, We want West Virginia to be competitive. Um, And we also have many members who are very quick to say, but let's remember we have government so the government can provide the essential services, uh, everything from highway building to crime protection to prisons and incarceration. Um, and uh, uh, take care of the public health. That's um, and I haven't even mentioned the the big one yet, which is education, K through 12, and higher education. To be good at those things, you got to spend money on them, and so it's a it's a balancing act, and that's why we respect the legislative process. Uh, this is when the citizens, uh, through their legislators, get to come together and say what kind of balance uh, we want to have. And uh, typically, the balance that works best is taxes that are lower and flatter and accepted by the taxpaying public and that also provide the important services that uh, we expect and need from our government. From a chamber's standpoint, do you tend to favor the Senate's plan, which addresses personal property tax, uh, business and inventory taxes, as opposed to the House's plan, which is just a flat personal income tax cut? We really like the Senate's plan. I have to tell you, we really like the Senate's plan. We think that the Senate's plan is, and and by the way, there is a great deal of support for that plan in the House. Um, And so I applaud and congratulate the House and the House leadership for uh, taking that stance. Um, The Senate plan would cut our personal income tax. Right now we have one of the higher personal income tax rates in the country. We, 44 states have a personal income tax. Uh, we rank 38th. Uh, if, if first was best, we rank 38th among the 44. 
um, the Senate plan would move us up to the 17th or 18th uh, best tax rate. We uh, A goal that we have at the West Virginia Chamber of Commerce is to be the best state for business. And we think a good start is to get in the top 20 um, in as many categories as possible. And uh, this Senate plan would move us solidly into the top 20 uh, of states for our personal income tax rate. We also, and it's a discussion that um, we all had, Rob, you and I and the Admiral, and and uh, about the um, Amendment 2, the voters said no on Amendment 2, but we still have a real problem in that we are the only state in the country that has this onerous tax on business equipment and inventory, and that's a disincentive to businesses to invest in new and more expensive uh, equipment because their taxes go up when they do that. Uh, As an example, I was with my dentist the other day, and he said, you know, in this little office, because I have the best equipment, uh, I'm trying to employ as many people as I can. Uh, this, uh, the, uh, the tax that I pay on my equipment is just unbelievable. And all I would have to do is go across the river and I wouldn't have to pay that tax. So, um, it's, it's a real thing. And, uh, the tax, half of that tax is addressed. Uh, by the Senate plan. You know, when people were out campaigning against Amendment 2, they said, oh, don't worry, we're going to take the tax off of your automobile and uh, the tax off of business equipment and inventory. Well, the only bill that we've seen that does that, um, and it only begins to do that, it takes half of it off, uh, takes all of it off for your automobile, but half of it off for your equipment and inventory would be the um, the Senate plan. So we think that's good. Uh, we also think eliminating the marriage penalty is good. We like the provisions for wounded and disabled veterans. So on the whole, we think there's a lot in there that the Senate has come up with a good plan. I think that's why it's being well-received in the House. And the governor, who was squarely on the side of going the personal income tax rate, has begun to say, you know, the Senate plan looks pretty good. So um, – uh, if I were advising you uh, which ball to keep an eye on, I'd say keep an eye on the Senate plan. Uh, that's the one that's getting the most favorable uh, reception and the most favorable attention. Admiral. Good morning, Steve. Good to talk with you again. Uh, Thank you, sir. Uh, Steve, you, you mentioned a couple of structural changes in the Senate plan, the, uh, the marriage penalty and also the uh, for the veterans, disabled veterans. Uh are there other structural changes that we should be talking about that have not yet been received, received very much attention? You know, uh, what a fantastic question that is. I, I believe the answer to that is yes. Um, and uh, I don't want to get too philosophical on you here, but let's remember we have a Constitution that really is rooted in the 1850s. Our West Virginia Constitution was basically taken from the Virginia Constitution. Uh, We amended it um, in the 1870s, and then we had some amendments in the 1930s. But chiefly, um, we have a constitution that is a 19th century document and a tax structure that is pretty much a 19th century tax structure. So uh, the short answer to that would be yes. Uh, Taking a real look at how we do these things would position our state to be much more competitive and much more up to date. Okay, as I, uh, I'm going to shift the gears a little bit, uh, uh, and I let me back up quickly. I think we did have an opportunity to do a, a uh, aggressive structural change, and I was a little disappointed we did not spend more time in looking at updating the tax structure. But that's that's for another yep. day. Yep. Uh, yep. The uh, during the amendment two discussion, we heard a great deal that uh, for the for bringing businesses in, it's best for a large income tax reduction, or it's best for a large personal tax reduction, automobile inventory tax and the like what i found missing in those discussions was hard data that would say one of the argument is preferable or more advantageous to bring business in i would think you would have that hard data and if you did did you introduce it at all during the recent amendment to discussion well from our point we certainly agree that it's really the data that matters 
And uh, so, Admiral, let me pick up on that for just a second when we're really thinking about the data. What the data says is that West Virginia's uh, inventory and equipment tax is is um, just almost unique among the states. Uh, they simply have other ways to do it. And uh, that was, of course, the message we were trying to get um, out. But uh, we only had uh, so much money to spend. We don't have the benefit of a state airplane to fly around in. And, and uh, frankly, the TV stations, all, and appropriately so, you know, the TV stations always cover the leading politicians, and they don't always cover the, the, the people who want to talk uh, science and, and uh, economics. Um, so what we have in West Virginia is uh, a tax structure that is simply rooted in the past. But but before I go too, too far down that road, let me say, you know, business is not really saying that the single biggest problem we have in West Virginia is tax. What we're saying is we should collect adequate tax to fund the essential services of government. Business wants to pay its fair share, and all we really need is a level playing field. Um, we don't need taxes that are way higher than the surrounding states. Remember, we have a corporate net income tax in West Virginia, and that corporate net income tax rate is higher than all of the surrounding states. Now, Pennsylvania has a higher tax rate, but they're lowering it. And um, in, in my opinion, and with all due respect to your listeners in Maryland, Maryland's not really in the competitive game. But um, uh, we've got a, a very – high uh, relative to other states' corporate net income tax rate, um, and um, and we haven't, uh, you know, we don't really have that on the table to be addressed, and it needs to be on the table to be addressed. Governor Youngkin is proposing cutting Virginia's corporate net income tax in half and then moving toward eventual elimination. Uh, in North Carolina, they've already cut their corporate net income tax in half, and they are moving toward elimination of that tax. So what I would like to see us talk about is policies that create jobs. And uh, to do that, and, and here's where I'm going to shift gears on you, to do that, we have to have a workforce. And to have a workforce, we have to have education and coordination between uh, uh, that includes the business community, uh, educators, um, and uh, higher ed. And those things all take resources. So, a we are not a we're not a zero tax group. Um, we are a group that says we expect to and want to pay our fair share. But let's keep an eye on what makes us competitive. And people go where the jobs are. We have states that have uh, lower ta- North Carolina, by the way, has um, uh, taxes that are similar to ours. The overall tax burden in North Carolina is almost identical to the overall tax burden uh, that we face in West Virginia. North Carolina is growing by leaps and bounds. We're not. So what is it that they have figured out that we haven't? We have similar terrain. We have similar um, cultural identities. What is it that they have figured out that we haven't? What I would say is they have figured out that um, education matters. A trained workforce matters. Higher education, which, frankly, we need to be funding more, matters uh, in the job uh, development game. Corey Roman. Mr. Roberts, thank you for being here. Um, and, and I um, share, you know, the sentiment that you just gave, um, you know, when you're describing um, business, that it isn't just simply um, taxes that we need to be looking at. Um, so as we're in this current session um, and as we're moving forward here, I know that you said um, – as the as the time goes on, you'll be able to identify uh, different bills that are attempting to um, reconcile some of these issues we have in the business world. Um, but I wanted to ask, are there any major pieces of legislation that you would like to see that aren't necessarily tax related, but that you believe would um, directly influence the business community? Uh, Councilman, and please uh, uh, call me Steve. Uh, that would just be fantastic. Um, yes, the answer to that is yes. We really are focused on bills that are working their way uh, through the legislature at this time that we think will improve education. We strongly support uh, the bill that I, I would say is getting a fair amount of attention 
that will put um, an aid in each classroom, K through three. We like that idea a lot. Uh, another concept that we really think deserves discussion is the idea of getting our children, uh, or at least having the opportunity for our children to go to school at a younger age. Now, before everybody, and I know I'm not referring to you, but before your listeners holler and say, what in the world is he thinking? Let me just say, we have a real child care problem in West Virginia. We have a real problem with our uh, uh, children not being first grade ready. Um, and uh, it has been, uh, the Admiral asked what kind of data is out there. There's all kinds of data out there that says the sooner we um, get children uh, out of what sometimes is a bad home situation and into a school situation where they are uh, being cared for by a caring adult, where they uh, are getting uh, at least uh, one and in most cases two good meals a day, um, and we expose them to learning, the faster they get on board with good learning. So we really, really like the idea of uh, having an optional program in our public schools where children at a much younger age can be taken to that school for child care uh, and for uh, pre-K services. Those would be two things that I think we could do almost immediately that would make a big, big change in uh, the direction that we're heading in West Virginia. Steve Roberts, our guest, President and CEO of the West Virginia Chamber of Commerce. Steve, let's talk about Form Energy, which became a controversial topic in the state legislature. Some of the folks there thought that it was bordering on socialism to have the state pour money into that investment by Form Energy uh, into the state. Uh, from the Chamber of Commerce standpoint, do you regard the state poning up money to attract corporations as a necessary evil in playing the game competitively? You know, well said, Rob. It's it's one of those things that you have to do in the 21st century if you want to be in the development game, especially for the big game changers. And um, we just are going to have to, our view is that we in West Virginia, we're just going to have to get used to the idea that uh, the states are competing for these 21st century jo- high wage jobs. Um, and uh, while we think it's very important to have a, a uh, Uh, an educated and prepared workforce and a reasonable tax and regulatory base that uh, is also attractive to employers. We very, very much like the idea of attracting form energy. We think this is the way uh, we're heading in the 21st century. Look, we've done lots of tax breaks for the coal industry, uh, among others, over the years. Um, And uh, the fact that we have come up with a a plan for that will – uh, make form uh, form uh, uh, industries come here is, from our point of view, a very very good idea. The the chief people who hope we uh, fail on this are are Pennsylvania and Ohio because if we fail on this, they will come in with a package and grab this company just as fast as they can. Steve, do you know when this trend started? this uh, situation where states, municipalities, whatever, fork over money to attract these companies? Was this something that was always there? We just didn't really hear about it from a publicity standpoint? I I don't know that it was always there. Certainly, uh, and without question, the competition has become more keen. But I can tell you, uh, as we've discussed on this show before, I'm originally from Huntington. I can tell you that Huntington was doing these kind of things in the 1940s. And uh, much, um, just a quick story on that. Um, leaders in Huntington recognized that uh, there was going to be a lot of industry related to the Second World War. They made um, they put together a group called the Huntington Industrial Corporation, and the uh, whole idea behind the Huntington Industrial Corporation was to attract industries that uh, might be expanding or growing and looking at West Virginia, and it worked fantastically. And Huntington prospered from that for a period of 40 years or so. Um, what what then happened was, uh, you know, let me fast forward. Uh, then West Virginia began to uh, raise its uh, taxes. West Virginia began to sort of take a 
business is captive here and we can just tax them more and treat them poorly. And that's what happened. And, and we found out the hard way that business um, is mobile. Uh, and let me put a number to that. The Admiral asked about facts, so let me just put a number to that. In uh, 1980, West Virginia had right at 130,000 manufacturing jobs. Today, we have about 46,000 manufacturing jobs. So uh, clearly, um, our policies uh, since 1980 have not worked to the benefit of creating manufacturing jobs. And states around us have seen significant growth. Kentucky is, uh, is a very, very good example of a state that has seen significant manufacturing growth since 1980, a net gain uh, of as many jobs as we lost. Steve, I find that number to be absolutely staggering. I've never heard that before. Uh, yep. Certainly the competition from other states has a bearing, but there has to be other reasons as well. What was the reason that we lost so many manufacturing jobs? Well, we, we've done a couple of, Admiral, we've done a couple of things wrong. Uh, and frankly, and, and, and I, I don't take any pleasure in saying this, we, we repeated uh, a mistake in not passing Amendment 2 uh, because we have high tax. The, the chief beneficiaries of Amendment 2, other than everybody who owns a, uh, a truck or a car, would have been manufacturers. Um, and so we've got this one tax that they just don't pay in other states. But we have other problems that we piled on top of that. Uh, we created a very hostile uh, legal uh, climate, uh, the Mandolitis-type lawsuits where it uh, didn't matter how much workers' comp insurance you had, uh, your workers' comp insurance could be pierced by what was called deliberate uh, actions. And uh, you couldn't really insure against those. I was very closely involved with a company that was um, uh, operated in Huntington and employed uh, well over a thousand people. And because of the Mandolitis decision, when they needed to expand, where did they go? They went about 20 miles west into Kentucky. Uh, and we just saw that happen time and time again. We had a company in North in uh, West Virginia in Huntington that was thriving. Uh, when it became time to expand, uh, where did they go? They went to North Carolina. Uh, we we can't tax them, sue them, um, and and then expect them to say everything here is fine. And that's what we did. I would guess in if, West you, Virginia. if you would do a study, there's got to be a correlation between manufacturing jobs lost and population lost over those 42 yes. years, Steve. Yes, yes, yes. The big untold story in West Virginia, in my opinion related to our economy is what we're talking about right now. We went from being a manufacturing powerhouse to um, uh, to a state that is hemorrhaging manufacturing jobs, and we've just now turned it around. I had manufacturer after manufacturer tell me, you know, pass a right-to-work law. That will make a difference. Well, we passed a right-to-work law. And uh, we've had announcement after announcement of company coming here. But we also passed tort reform. We passed substantial tort reform. Uh, we changed our workers' comp laws. You know, we, we were told in the early 2000s that it would just be a disaster to change our workers' comp law and to privatize our workers' comp system. Well, we changed our workers' comp laws. We privatized our workers' workers' comp system, and our workers' comp co costs have gone from being the highest, uh, among the highest in the country, and definitely the highest on a per covered worker basis, to now some of the most reasonable in the uh, country. So, um, the Chamber of Commerce has been out there proposing solutions, but we got a lot of stubborn people in West Virginia, and. Uh, uh, I love, I'm a native West Virginian, so I have plenty of license to say that. And um, we, what we've not done is focus on those things that will help us grow. Right now, the big issue is, you know, you can't be 50th in, in your test scores and then turn around and say everything's fine in the public school system. And believe me, I know teachers have got a hard job. My mother was a teacher. My sister is a teacher. Dedicated teachers love their students. They've got a hard job, but we just can't sit back in West Virginia and say, well, we've got a lot of poor children and they can't learn. We, what we need to do is say we've got a lot of poor children. Yes, we acknowledge that. 
we have to do whatever we can to help them not be poor, and we also have to figure out how to help them succeed in life, because poor people can succeed in life. We just have to have the policies that help them get there. Steve Roberts, good stuff. Thanks so much for your time this morning.